Are you ready? Yes. We have been in the last uh, few weeks really focusing in on something that I think is the very foundation if we're going to transform, if we're going to accept the hero challenge, if we're going to be everything that God has called us to be, that he lived and died to make us, this is the pivotal truth that has to be the anchor of our lives. And that is our identity in him. And Brad shared a few weeks ago, he told a story of the butterfly. Remember his shut up message? If you weren't here for that, go download shut up. It will make sense to you then. But he told a story of a butterfly and how, how crazy it must be for a caterpillar that crawls along his whole entire life, takes a nap, wakes up, and has wings and can fly. And that same transformation is, is likened into what's happened to us when, when Christ becomes our identity. We're no longer crawling around in the dust. And so e it's so easy and so often we find ourselves going back to what we were and not embracing the new identity that Christ paid for us. So that's what we've been talking about. And I really feel like that is a huge factor. And I keep pointing up here because in case you forget what our six areas are for this year, you can just look up there. So every time I do that, that's what I'm doing, in case you're wondering. Um, <laughs> but we talk about living out this new identity. And I don't know if you're ever like me, but if you are, which I suspect you might be, there's times that you look in the mirror or you look at something you've done, or you look at how your life around you looks, and you see a chasm, a gap from where you are now to the place that God promised you to be, to the identity that he created you to have, to the life that you know that you've been called to live. And somehow it's so frustrating, and I don't know if you're like me, but if when I do start to focus on that gap, of here I am, you said I was this new creature, and here I am, I see myself in the mirror and I don't have these traits. I'm not living the way you created me to live. I'm not embracing um, this new identity that I have and, and this chasm between who you are or who you see in the mirror, that reflection, and who he says you are. Am I the only one that's ever seen that gap? No, okay, good. Um, but that's, that's a frustrating place to be. And this morning we're gonna share for a few minutes about something that I feel is foundational if we're going to bridge that gap. Something that I feel like if it's the, the one X factor, if you will, okay, to bridge the gap. And this morning we're going to be talking about the subject of grit. Can you say grit with me? All right. I know if you're like me, um, well, I'll, I'll go get to that in a second, but I want to read the scripture to you, 2 Timothy 1, 7, and I'm reading it out of the Amplified Bible version because it just makes it amplified. Amazing, huh? For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, of cowardice, of craven, cringing, and fawning fear, but he has given us a spirit of power and of love and of calm and well-balanced mind and discipline and self-control. That's a that's big. I don't know, that's the foundation of what we're going to be talking about this morning because in this new identity that's been purchased for us, there's so many times we live weak lives, lives of um that are powerless to whatever emotion comes our way, to whatever fear says, to whatever the circumstance say, to whatever the checkbook balance says, to whatever that voice in your head, which might be your mother-in-law, might be Oprah, I don't know who is in your brain, but that voice says you should be and you are, powerless to that because you can never get that voice to shut up or powerless to the frustrating cycles that you find yourself in over and over and over again. And we feel like we've been stripped. But the Bible says here clearly that God didn't give us a spirit of timidity. He gave us a spirit of power, love, and of self-control. I don't know about you, but for me, that just kind of like does something to me. It kind of just power, love, and self-control. Essentially, God gave us his spirit. He gave us his love. He gave us his power. He gave us his ability to exercise self-control in our lives. And for us to walk around stripped 
of that power, stripped of that love, and stripped of the ability to exercise that self-control is the same equivalent of a caterpillar that just keeps crawling around. You know, he's already been transformed in a butterfly, but just decides to keep crawling everywhere because that's what he knows. And we talked about this in our Bible study this week in the study of Galatians that the women, men, you're not invited, but ladies come if you can. But just how, how Paul is expressing to the Galatians in that book, how frustrated he is that Christ purchased this freedom for them, but they keep going back to the law. And it's the same thing for us. We've been purchased, we've been given power, love, and self-control, yet we just are okay with crawling around in the dirt and acting like we're still caterpillars when we have wings to fly. So there was a study done, and, and if you search this out, you can find a lot of information out there. But basically, um, what happened was they took 1,200 students from West Point. Does everyone know who, what West Point is? Okay. If you don't, it's a very prestigious academy that most of our military and like generals and things all have gone through. Politicians, it's a big, it's a big thing, okay? It's the best of the best go there. Anyway, there's another story about that, but I won't go there. Um, anyway, so West Point, they bring in these 1,200, and they have worked hard to get to this school. I um, dated a guy one time that got into West Point, and it was like you had to be appointed by someone and have endorsements from, from rep, like politicians in your area or various people you had to have. They check you out. It's like you had to pass through all these things to get to the school. It's more than just you know, SAT scores. And they take 1,200 of these incoming West Point students and they do a study on them. And basically the study is they had the people rate them on their SAT scores, their agility, their how they did in high school, their popularity, all of these factors that played into their life before they got there. Their talent, their every part of them was taken into consideration. And then they watched how they performed and they were trying to find the common thread to see who was successful. And they put them through these, this horrible boot camp type experience where they test the very limits of who they are. And they go through the entire process and they couldn't find anything that linked them. It wasn't necessarily the smartest people. It wasn't necessarily the, the most athletically inclined. It wasn't necessarily the most, you know, um, people that had the best friendships or relationships. It wasn't any of those factors, but they did find one common factor. And this common factor that they found, that all of the people that were the highest performers, the ones that went on to do the biggest things, were the ones that had the highest score in one area. And the weird thing about this area is it wasn't, um, it wasn't like, a, a, just like you could get a four or five, it was a very subjective thing, okay? So the, the, the leaders and, coaches, I don't know, professors, whatever, the people that were giving these scores out gave them a score in what is called, are you ready? Anybody interested? Do you want to know? Okay. I just wondered if you're curious because I can stop the story. No, okay. Okay. So they scored them on what they called the grit factor. The grit factor. There was no like evidence that gave them this substantiated answer that, but it was an arbitrary, like they gave each person the grit factor. And that was the common denominator. It didn't have to do with where they had been or all of their skills or their talents. Sure, those things helped. It didn't matter their IQ. The thing that saw them through to their success was the grit factor. And I thought that was really interesting because, I don't know, when I think of Christianity, or when I think of what the world thinks of Christianity, I feel sometimes like there's like floating clouds and angels and rainbows and pots of gold and like we're like eating grapes and there's mansions. And, and I think we have this I idea that Christianity and our faith and what we've been called to is this life of living above whatever happens in the world. And we're just comfortable, and Jesus loves us, this I know, and we're going to go to heaven, and f so that's, that's that. Life should be perfect. But I feel like, okay, so pretend I invented a new toothpaste, and I wanted to sell this to the world, okay? I mean, can you, like, one word that I would absolutely never use is grit. Because when you think of grit, do you think of clean and sparkling and fun? No, no, you think of dirty and, 
and messy and I think of people that are gritty and they're not sparkling and clean and pretty and tied up in a little bow. So I feel like oftentimes we put Christianity in this toothpaste box of like everything's wonderful and you're going to have that tingly feeling and get to heaven and it's all going to be wonderful when in reality it's not necessarily, that's not the promise that we've been given. In fact, if it was, why would God need to give us a spirit of power, love, and self-control? Who needs that when you're lying around on a cloud and someone's feeding you grapes? You don't. You just don't need it. But he, he called us to a life, a challenge to be heroes. And we're going to talk just a few more minutes about that this morning, the grit factor, okay? And my question for you this morning is this. What is your grit factor? Ask yourself this. What is my grit factor? How bad do I want it? And the it being closing that gap. The it being becoming and seeing in the mirror who God has called you to be and walking out the destiny that he has for your life and not giving up until you see that today in your life and those cycles that you've been going through over and over, you're finally able to get over them and through them and past them and victory in those areas so that you can walk in the promises that God has for you. Are you guys down for that? Okay, so what is my grit factor? How bad do I want it? And the truth of the matter is the spiritual battle, the spiritual side has already been won, and we know that. Jesus came, he paid the price. Everything that we need for life and godliness has already been taken care of through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection on the cross. Can I get your agreement on that? Yes, okay. So the battle for bridging that chasm, Jesus doesn't need to do anything else. He's already done what he's going to do. He already also gave us a spirit of what? Power, love, and self-control. He already gave that to us. He already died on the cross. And so many times we're sitting in our prayer closet asking him for more, asking him to do a bigger work or fix this problem again. When he's done everything he can do, the battle now most often is in our mind. The struggle now is how bad do we want to see God, that reality in our lives? What can we do? We don't need to strive in works. We don't need to strive in performance. That's not at all what I'm talking about. But that grit factor comes to play. To see transformation in your life, there's a battle that has to take place. And it's not in the spiritual realms because that's already been taken care of. There's a battle in our mind. There's a battle in our body. There's a battle to move forward and actually grab what God has given to us. Out of Galatians chapter 5, verse 23, it says, these are the gifts and the fruits of the Spirit. It says, the fruits of the Spirit is gentleness, meekness, humility, self-control. Can you say self-control? In parentheses, it kind of just, in case you don't know what self-control means, it's going to tell you again. Self-restraint, continence, that's a good word. <laughs> Against such things, there is no law gentleness, meekness, humility, self-control. These are things that when we have God's spirit in us, which we do, he's given us. These are the fruits, the evidence of the fact that God's spirit dwells in you is you have these characteristics in your life. Okay, so when a baby is born, and we have a couple of babies in here this morning, Cleo, for example, is a precious, perfect little baby, and she has a tricep. She has it. It's been given to her. She had, when she was born, she was born with a tricep. If I asked her to do a couple push-ups this morning, if I asked her to, you know, do whatever these ones are or something or the skull crushers or whatever those things are, if I asked her to do that, I'm pretty sure she's not going to be able to do it. I mean, when you're a month old, you just, you don't have that strength to do it. But does she have the muscle? Yeah, she does. And we all have the things that God, I just told you, we have the spirit of power, love, and self-control. But often, so many of us stay like Cleo. We stay in the, God's given it to us. We have it there. But eventually, you have to use it or it just has never has any strength. It never gets the oomph. And the, the way that you get from Cleo to someone really buff in this room. Okay, maybe I'll think of someone outside of this room. Um, I'm just kidding. Um, as buff as Ryan Larson. If you see Ryan, sometimes he'll just stop and do push-ups in the middle of nowhere because he knows how important it is to exercise those muscles, <laughs> doesn't he? I can pick on my brother. I'm allowed. But, but if you never use it, 
you never have it when you need it. So if I never do any of those things that I don't know what the words are, chances are when I need to do something with that muscle, is it going to be there for me? Is it going to be strong enough for me to use? The answer is no. And so God's given us what we need. We're, we've got it in us, but it's our job to exercise that grit factor to get what we want. And I'm kind of likening that grittiness to mental toughness to our ability and hunger and desire to get what God has promised to us. Because sitting in the seat and clocking in every Sunday, even doing a few little extra things throughout the week, even going on a trip, even obeying God and giving, even doing all these things aren't actually going to cause transformation. But that hunger and that passion and that never giving up until I see what God has promised me manifest in my life, that's what's going to get us to where we need to be, that hunger. There's three things that I guarantee you will keep your grit muscle as weak as possible. So if you would like to stay weak, if you would like to have absolutely no strength and no ability to fight the battles that are in your life, to fight the mental battle that you have to face, to bridge the gap, then I promise you, if you do these three things, absolutely you'll get what you want. But if you want to see the grit factor exercise in your life, if you want to be able to get and bridge that gap and to get where God has called you to be, don't do these three things, okay? Just clarifying. First one, three ways to lose our grit. Number one, consider ourselves. Now those West Point studs, they could have come in and been like, well, you know what? I was at the top of my class. I was the star, fo star football player. I did this. I got this on my SAT. They could be really proud of their accomplishments. And they, you know, they, they did something wonderful. They did something very few people do. They made this great stride to get where they wanted to be. And they could just consider that and consider their own strength and stay there. But I guarantee you, the people who rested in who they were and who they saw in the mirror didn't have that grit factor. And then there's the people that could consider themselves and be like, well, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not that strong or I'm not that brave or I haven't been through, you know, I, I, I was raised poor or my daddy didn't love me or all of these things we can consider ourselves in the negative. Either way, when we consider ourselves, we're canceling out the grit factor in our lives. The second thing that we can do is consult and that's consulting our past. You can consult what you've been through what what hurts you've ha what what hurts have happened to you the brokenness that you have what you didn't have what uh, what opportunities were not afforded to you the times that you failed the times that you've messed up the things that you haven't done right the people you've let down all even the successes that you have if you consult your past i guarantee you your grit muscle will never grow it won't because you'll be too busy exercising the whiner muscle i'm just saying Sorry, I just, I just invented the whiner muscle. Um, right now, you're here. And the last thing that we can do that will cl definitely most 100% kill our grit factor is compare. You were created to be you. You were created to walk out the destiny that you have. You were created uniquely. The Bible says that you were knit in your mother's womb. Your days were numbered and planned out before the foundations of the earth. There is no one on this planet that can live your life but you. Nobody. So to compare yourself and where you stand today and to look on Facebook and at people's glossy photoshopped lives and imagine why you're not as cool as them or they have this and you don't have that or to judge things and to compare yourself to someone else, number one way, kill any grit factor you have. We'll kill it. Because we're not created like anyone else. We're created to be ourselves. We're created to walk out the destiny that God has for us. To compare yourself to someone else is a waste of time and absolutely foolish. So I want to tell you of the toughest person that lived, and that was Jesus. When you think about the mental toughness that Jesus had to have in the three years of ministry that he walked on the earth, it's... It's ridiculous. Bible says in Matthew 26, and this is just at the culminating crux of everything that he had lived for, but here he is born. His life's all kind of wacky. His mom and dad, there's some drama and stuff going on at the beginning. He's probably just like, things aren't just as normal as everybody else's happy little lives. And he could have compared himself. He could have consulted that he was born in a barn instead of a palace. He could have um, considered the situation, but instead, he had a mental toughness that, that none of us 
have and that as we pattern our lives and reach for, we'll see God's greatness in our lives. Matthew 26, 38 says this, Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet, not as I will, but as you will. I don't know about you, but there's no puffiness or clouds or grapes or wings or floatiness in that scripture. In fact, to me, I can't imagine the, that scripture just feels weighty. Like, can you imagine the heaviness that he was holding at that moment, knowing what was ahead, knowing that he was giving his entire life, but also knowing that the weight of the world's sin was going to be put upon him. He's, he's like in anguish. Take this from me. I can't do it, but... Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Nevertheless. And the toughness and the, the grit that's there, Jesus was not a sparkly toothpaste too. He was gritty. He, Christianity is not what I think so many times we think it is. In fact, it's, it's messy. It's hard. And it requires more than we thought we had, but we have it. Because he gave us spirit of what? Power love, and self-control. It's there. Just like your tricep, it's in there. But have you used it? What is your grit factor? How bad do you want it? Do you want it enough to hit the gym and do a couple of these? I don't mean the gym, but maybe I mean the gym. I don't know. Do you need to go to the gym? I'm not answering that. <laughs> but how bad do you want to see God transform your life? How bad do you want to be able to live and move and walk out the destiny that he has for you, knowing that your life is full of the purpose that he created for you. How bad do you want that? Because how, that factor is my percentage on uh, the probability that it's going to happen in your life. Because if you're fine just living safe Christianity, happy, no, no waves move, just live in the box and stay in the box, stay in the box. But Jesus didn't stay in the box. Your body and your mind, your, your body and your mind will quit a thousand times before when you exercise that grit muscle, you can push through those barriers. Push through them. You can push through consulting your past. You can push through comparing yourself. You can push through all these factors when you have the grit factor. Um, <clears throat> and I thought this was interesting when I was reading. That, that phrase that Jesus said, not as I will, but as you will. Because I think that so often we, inter we, did, we associate self-control with saying no to things, like saying no to the cookies on the counter, or saying no to the decadent chocolate cake, or saying no to the dripping in and out burger that you just want. We think self-control is when I can just say no. To whatever's in front of me, I can say no. But actually, if you look at Jesus, he's, he's saying not as I will. So yes, that's no. But what he's actually saying is yes. He's actually saying yes to your plan for my life, God. Yes to what you have for me. So if you and I could grab a hold of the fact that God's asking us to say yes to many things and that it's going to require probably more than we think we have in the tank, but as we start exercising it slowly and methodically and day to day and we put that self-control to use, we learn to um, speak words of love to our family members. We determine that we're going to wake up and seek God first and what he says before we consult what the checkbook says, before we consult what the mirror says, before we consult what our mom says about us, that we're going to find what he says about us first. If we have that hunger and that drive and that tenacity to go for it all the way, no matter what, until you achieve that final, and I don't know that we'll ever necessarily achieve, so I'm not saying in term, that finality, but I'm saying to go forward with the purpose and the plan that God has for our lives. I love this scripture. It's Paul talking. He says in 1 Corinthians 9, 26, he says, Therefore I run thus. This is the way I run. Not like Phoebe. No. He says, this is the way I run. Not with uncertainty. This is the way I fight. Not as one who beats the air. But I discipline my body and bring it to subjection. Lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. 
We have the ability to exercise that self-control muscle in our lives. We have the power because Jesus paid the price that his spirit could live in us. And God has given us a spirit of power, love, and self-control. Steve, you can come on up. We asked during our um, RBQ question who the toughest person you know is. And for me, that was like an absolute no-brainer. And I didn't get to talk to any of you, so I'm going to tell you now. Um, probably if I have to like think of the toughest person I know, it would be my dad. And if you've met my dad, you would probably would agree. Because he's got that like, he's a little older now, but he has like that, he's a little intimidating. He's got kind of like that James Dean, like I don't care, I don't, I don't know. He's just got that toughness. And I remember being a kid um, sitting around the dinner table and there would be a lot of nights that we'd all be eating dinner and we'd look up and we'd see like there's like masking tape like wrapped around my dad's hand or wrist or forearm. It didn't matter like masking tape. And we always knew what that meant because he, he worked on cars in the auto body and he's always welding something or cutting sharp metal and it wouldn't be very uncommon for him to burn himself with some sort of chemical or practically sever a limb. It's just kind of like normal life for my dad. He's always just working hard using his body. And so we'd see the masking tape and we'd know something happened at work today. And we'd, my mom would say, Scott, what happened today? He'd be like, oh, well, I just, you know, I practically chopped off my finger. And I just dipped it in paint thinner, wrapped it in masking tape and kept working. And uh, she, we always just rolled our eyes, but we knew he was tough and he was going to finish the job that he started that day. And if you look at his hands today, oh my gosh, they are scarred up. They are, uh, they look leathery and his fingers are thick and arthritic and he's, he's got, a, he's been through a lot and you can see that his body has had to be tough over the years. Um... But I know this, that it wasn't just because he's trying to be cool or trying to be tough or trying, not too busy to stop, you know, what he's doing to go properly medically give attention to his wounds. But actually, he knew the situation and he knew that if he didn't finish that job, then there was three little mouths that might not get fed. And he knew that if he didn't, uh, persevere through whatever pain that momentary thing would be, that there was a chance that he couldn't provide for his family and that there were people relying on him. And in the same way I think about Jesus, and especially that scene in the garden of the weight of the world being on him, the weight of our sin, the weight of the ugliness of the worst day and the worst thing you or I or anyone on this planet could do and he had that on him. And the amount of pressure and intensity and pain that he must have known was coming ahead. But yet he persevered through. And why? Hebrews 12, 1-3 says this. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders the sin that so easily entangles us. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Then it says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And this is a part I want you to hear. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I kind of imagine heaven like a giant dinner table. And he knew that if he could endure the cross, there was going to be something at the end of it. There was going to be a, a giant dinner table. And if he didn't endure it, you and I wouldn't be able to be at that table. He knew that we were relying on him. And that's how he could go through what he went through. That's how he could go through the extreme torture and die and rise again with the hope that at the end of that, people were relying on him. People needed him. And our lives weighed in the balance. And I, I know this challenge could seem silly to some, the hero challenge. 
Like, what's the big idea? Like, who cares if I still struggle with this sin from time to time? Who cares if I just never really get my act together? That's my business. That's my life. You know, that's what I've got going on. Why, why does it matter so much? Why can't I just live a safe life? Why can't I just be happy and comfortable? I live here in Scottsdale, Arizona. I moved here so I could golf. Why can't I just do that? Because people are relying on you and me. People are relying on us taking God's message of love and reaching them with it. And if our lives are so consumed with safety, with brokenness, if we're willing to still stay in the dust and crawl around and forget that he purchased us wings, those people can't be reached. Because I don't go to your Starbucks. I don't know your barista. I don't have your mother-in-law. I don't have your next door neighbor. You do. And God has placed you where he created you to be in this moment, in this city, in this church family right now because there are people that are relying on you, flexing that muscle and saying, how bad do I want it? How bad do I want to see their lives change? How bad do I want it? And I believe that if we'll put that same joy before us, that we can begin to exercise that self-control in our daily lives. We'll begin to see, it, suddenly it won't be just about saying no to this thing that's tempting us or saying no to this thing or treating our, you know, oh God, I have to be nice to my husband, are you serious? Or walking out the things that God's placed before us. Instead, it becomes about saying yes to the dinner table where we can all be together in God's family that he's created us to be. It's saying yes to the future and the plan that he created for each one of us to have. If you'll bow your heads and close your eyes with me this morning, God, I'm so grateful that you sent your son. And Jesus, I'm so grateful that you were able to endure the cross, that you were so tough because I know I wouldn't be here. I know I wouldn't have the joy that I have. I know I wouldn't have the hope that I have if it wasn't for that. And I'm so grateful this morning, God. And I'm so grateful that you give us chance after chance after chance to get out of the dirt and to find our identity in you so that the people that are relying on us can be reached with your love. So this morning, if you're here and you want that, you want to get out of the dust and grab a hold of the spirit of power and love and self-control that's been purchased for you already and start to flex those muscles. The first muscle that you can flex right now is stand to your feet. Let's stand to our feet. If you're going to say, that's me, and this morning I'm sick of just being comfortable, I'm sick of just living for what myself but I'm going how bad do I want it I want what you have for me this morning God let's just pray together you guys can repeat after me there's no judgment or condemnation we're just saying yes to God like yes you you lived and died and I'm not gonna make that for nothing I'm gonna live and I'm gonna bridge the gap so I can I can have the life that you purchased for me and I can touch the lives that you intended for me to touch Father God, you guys can repeat after me. Father God, this morning I'm saying yes. I'm saying yes to a life full of your power, love, and self-control. I don't care how messy it gets. I'm not afraid to get my hands dirty. I want what you have for me that bad. I want your promises in my life to be real, and I want to walk out the purpose that you created me to live for. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can be seated.
their smiles, the joy that, that they get when they open that box, it's almost like they're breathing the Lord in when they open that. It's beautiful. These kids, they've never had a gift like this. And when we can give a gift and do it in the name of Jesus Christ, it means everything in the world. Not only did I receive a gift, but I also prayed to receive Christ as my Lord. This is Christmas! <laughs> Operation Christmas Child is going to great lengths to reach these children, to find these children, and show them love through these shoe boxes. It's not just you give a box and we walk away. This is long-term spiritual effect that we're having on these communities and on these countries. We want to impact the world. This is my way of entering another country without physically going. Now that's the power of a simple gift. All right, who wants to get in on some of that? Awesome. Well, it's first Sunday, which also means we take a few minutes in the service to highlight our eyes wide open focus for the month. And for the month of October, we're going to be focusing on Operation Christmas Child. Um, for those of you who haven't been here in years past, uh, Scott and Sarah Shimon um, generously throughout the year gather supplies and toys and things for this. And then we come together as a church and pack boxes. And last year, we got about 350 boxes. And uh, Noel, Jackson, Addison, and I delivered those. <laughs> so next, this time we'd like some help, because that was crazy. Um, but we put it up in our uh, pickup truck and took it to the drop-off site, and it got distributed to children all over the world. So um, this year we have a packing party on the 20, what is it, Selena, 1st? 21st, yes. It'll be Sunday after service, and... Um, we're gonna come together, we have little wrapping stations and we have the gifts sorted by age and you can pack boxes for boys or girls in different age groups and it's a lot of fun. The kids love to help with that so it's great as well with that. Um, and so we'll be here from 12 to four on that day packing. Um, if you would like to help with a gift towards the shipping, um, Samaritan's Purse ships all the boxes for free, but they say it costs $7 a box to get it from the location to the child. And if you want to give um, a gift to defray any of that, you can give however much. It costs $7, so there's your target. Um, so anyway, that's what we're focusing on the month of October. And... Um, our Eyes Wide Open, if you have never been to eyeswideopen.me, it's just a website that we have that just um, focuses on different things that we can be aware of in the world um, where we can make a difference in the lives of people. So that's where we are, and that's our Eyes Wide Open segment this month. It's also going to take a quick moment for our time of giving back to God. Um, this week in our Bible study, not only did I cry again, but <laughs> um, we talked about being part of God's family. And I think um, coming here together as the E3 family and, and being part of God's global family, it's just an opportunity to give towards the things that our church does. We have a very small operating budget. We don't really have much in way of salaries. Um, we pay rent and air conditioning. Thank Jesus for the air conditioning. But we have a lot of money that goes to outreach and to missions, and we support Haiti and things like that. And so your giving enables us to continue going, to continue to sit in air conditioning, and to make a difference in both our community and the world. So if you're part of our church family, this is our time to give back to God. Checks to E3 Scottsdale. There is an envelope in the chair in fr um, front of you if you want to... Um, give a cash gift. And if it is your first time, we'd like to welcome you, invite you to come back. There's a communication card in the seat in front of you as well. Um, if you want to fill that out, we can send you a gift. And if you have had any information change, if you've moved in the last year, chances are we don't have your current address unless 
you filled out a communication card. So if you want to get um, your information uh, current, please go ahead and do that. We do send emails from time to time. Um, so those are our um, giving back to God. We'll pray real quick, and then the ushers will collect the buckets as you pass them to the center. Father, we thank you that we can call you Father and that we're part of your family. And we thank you for the privilege of giving to the work that, that you are doing in the world, for being a part of it, for being able to participate in Operation Christmas Child or be able to go to the homeless shelter, or to be able to even just make a difference with our barista at Starbucks. We just thank you that you have enabled us and empowered us to go out in your love and with a sound mind, self-discipline. We just pray right now that you will bless each person as they give, that you will multiply these gifts, and that it will impact your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so if you want to grab those buckets on the outside, go ahead and pass them in. We have one quick announcement this week. We do have lots of things going on, and if you want to check the website, e3church.com, or our Facebook pages where we post a lot of our events. You get more information there. This week, we just want to highlight real quick, Tuesday night, we have another night of prayer. Um, it was so much fun last time, and I know you don't really associate fun with prayer, but it really was, and it was a good time of just kind of breaking down something that can be kind of intimidating and scary into something that was just so simple, but so useful in taking it to the next step and, and going and actually having a tool to pray and feeling like it's doing something. It was just fantastic. We encourage all of you to come. It's going to be um, this Tuesday, 7 p.m. There is child care, so if you're bringing a kid, please go ahead and sign up out there so we know how many kids are coming and can have that covered. Um, but it's just for an hour. Please bring a Bible, because most of us didn't, <laughs> and they're useful. So uh, bring a Bible for our time of prayer, and it'll just be an hour Tuesday night. Really encourage you to come. Other than that, have a fantastic week, and we'll see you back here next time, or Tuesday, or Thursday, or Saturday at Run Club, or on Facebook. So we've got lots of places to hook up. All right.